Coming up on today's Keys News Science Special. We marvel at the use of technology in the superhero world. We got curious about our forests. And our sensors were put to the test in the sensory sand pit. The 10 Years Science Festival is back celebrating the industry in multiple venues across Manchester and Salford. Starting on the 20th of October, the event invited all ages to take part in science activities and learn more about the field. And at the weekend, one of the venues hosting the festival was right here at Salford University's own Media City campus. Matt McGladdery has a roundup of what went on. The arrival of Tim Peake last week sparked the excitement for Salford University's Science Jam, which is part of the Manchester Science Festival. This year's event at Media City will be host to some of the most weird but fascinating features from across the whole festival. Organisers hope this will inspire future scientists, maybe even astronauts, but the main message they want to get across is just how fun science can be. From testing out your drone skills and trying to get the highest score, to having your brain hacked to optical illusions, there was something to interest everyone. It was the children who seemed to enjoy it most, however, and it wasn't hard for them to pick out their favourite parts. Shooting Spider-Man outside. I liked playing in the stand and controlling all of the books. And I, and I liked touching the millipede. Probably the uh, robot, because there's a robot downstairs. Science experts, lecturers and students alike were in full force to provide the best starting point for the next generation of geniuses. Well, we think it's crucial that, that young people get a sense of how much fun science can be, but also how many questions there are still to answer. So for everything that we're doing, the scientists there with all their cutting edge methods and all their technology still have big questions that we haven't solved. And so when you come along, you'll get a sense of how much we've done, but just how much still there is left to do. So we want young people to come along, understand that science is, is fun, that they can do it, that it's for them. It's not something that's just um, for other people, but this is open to everyone. And they can find their route into science. There are lots of different ways people get into science, and participating in a science festival is a really good start. Salford Science Jam has definitely been jam-packed full of science, tech, food, and even animals like this snake. I'm Matthew McGladdery, reporting for Keys News. Joined with us now is Dr Gary Kerr, who is the creative producer of the Salford Science Jam and researcher in science festivals. So Gary, it looks like an incredible event. Can you tell us a bit more about your involvement? Yeah, so my role was of creative producer of the Science Jam. So it involved creating unique um, exhibitions and activities and bringing various people from the university and from outside together. So we're really lucky this year. We had representatives from every school at the university here at Salford Unit. And we also worked with a number of artists and external organisations to create a really unique, inspiring and immersive event for, for all the family. So how does it, so obviously there's art and there's sort of science. How do you square those two things up? Because they don't seem to be things that, that mix very well. Well, I think that's like a real misconception that people have that art and science don't go well together. But actually art and science really do go hand in hand. An example of that is at the Science Jam, we had Helen Sharman's space suit that she actually wore when she was going up into space. Now this was only possible because artists and designers worked with material scientists and engineers to create this suit. So there's so many art and science collaborations that go on. And we really demonstrated that during the Science Jam with performance performing storytelling, uh, visual artwork, along with our scientists and engineers and environmentalists we had at the Science Jam as well. Sounds like it's been really successful and in its 10th year, where do you see it going next? Yeah, so Manchester Science Festival in the 10 years um, that it's had has become uh, the most successful science festival in England. It's got the best attended science festival and that's really due to Manchester's ambition mm -hmm. and history for science and technology. So you might be aware this year Manchester is the European city of science um, and that really shows how vibrant Manchester is uh, and how positive it is about science and how science is really embedded with it, within the culture of Greater Manchester. Uh, so I think where it's going in the future is it's just going to get more ambitious and turn into a better festival. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. Are you hoping to get kids involved then? Yeah, I mean, we always have kids involved in the Science Festival. Um, uh, the Manchester Science Festival is a great festival. It uh, has events for kids, it's got events for family, uh, for adults and everyone. Uh, there's something for everyone. And I have to ask you as well, you brought on, uh, along with you, this, this uh, contraption. Can you show you what you brought yes, on into the studio? Yes. 
So this I've got um, this, is... It, it looks, I must say, it looks like a strimmer <laughs> with a piece of toilet paper attached to it. <laughs> you're absolutely right. You're not, you're not far off. It's a leaf floor with a piece of toilet paper uh, attached. Very technical. And very very technical, technical indeed, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. as is uh, science communication. <laughs> right, okay. So what I'm going to demonstrate is really the essence of Manchester Science Festival, because Manchester Science Festival uses fun and engaging methods to communicate sometimes really complex science. Well, I was going to say, it's not a precision piece of kit, this, is it? This it's is, not this a precision is, piece of kit. This is indicative, isn't it? It yeah. is. And this is something that <laughs> I'm just so going to use. It, um, what does it do exactly? Right, so what I'm going to demonstrate is I'm going to demonstrate how an airplane can stay in the sky. Okay. So with this bit of toilet roll, if I blow over it, right. you can see that nothing really happens because I'm not blowing very fast. So because I'm not blowing very fast, then the air pressure underneath so, so is like quite high. Would it be fair to say it's like a wing of an aeroplane? Exactly, almost? so it's like a wing of an aeroplane. Okay. However, if we put lots of air yeah. and move it very fast over the surface of the toilet paper or the wing, then you can see that the air pressure underneath um, remains very low, and that keeps the airplane in the sky. I so if you don't mind, I'm just going to demonstrate. We'd, we'd like to see how it yeah, goes. All right. I'm in the Let's go. Line. So you were right in the fire. It's not getting really fast. Oh, it is. There we go now. It's going really slow. Well, Excellent work there. thank you very much. Excellent work. <laughs> so there you go. And that just demonstrates... Perfect for Halloween, don't you think? What do you perfect think? for Halloween, perfect yeah. Perfect for Halloween, perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> We've got thank a real mess to clear up. I don't think props are going to about that, but there we are. That's very well, good. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have you in the studio. Thank you for having me. Thank yeah, you very much. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Have you ever wanted to experience becoming a superhero? Well, with green screen technology at Media City, people got a chance to, to find out, and they loved it. Priya Matharu found out more. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's not even just Superman. It's many people from across Manchester here at Media City to be transported to another world using green screen technology. So, um, what are you doing to help here today? Um, I'm standing behind this camera and um, kind of filming the kids when they're standing right in front of them so they can see themselves on the TV screen with clouds behind them and feel like they are real superheroes. People certainly came dressed up and many were enthusiastic about using the technology. So did you have fun using the green screen? Yeah, it was really fun because you could put the thing, put the costume things on, and, and you could be invisible. Yeah. Invisible. Yeah. And who have you come dressed as today? Red Wayne. <laughs> mixed enjoyed? with Iron Man. Mixed with Iron Man. I found the green screen really interesting. It's quite fun to fiddle around with and yeah. see what you can make appear and disappear. It's and quite cool, like when you disappear. Yeah, yeah. it is. And it's also interesting because it's used a lot in um, filmmaking of all types. I guess it's a different experience. Like, obviously, before I never knew how to do it. You knew it was a green screen, but you never see it in action. I thought it was an edit after as well. Um, and I don't know, it just felt like you was in like a Harry Potter movie where you got the visibility cloak on. So that was pretty awesome. But yeah. So as you can see, everyone from all ages have had a super day experimenting with the science behind technology and becoming their favourite superheroes. And you can't have Superman without Batman. So I guess now justice has been served. Priya Matharu, Keys News. Rooted firmly on the third floor of Salford's Media City campus was the Forest of Curiosity. Matthew Wood reports. And Curiosity, the wonderful world of science, has arrived here in Salford. Known as the European City of Science, Manchester's Museum of Science Industry has hosted a decade of science festivals, with a bit of help from Media City. The university campus is totally occupied by all things science this weekend, but only on the third floor will you find the Forest of Curiosity. Straying away from the technological wonders of virtual reality and real-life astronauts, the Forest of Curiosity allows us to take an in-depth look into forest as an ecosystem, including the behaviour of different animals, insects and even bacteria. Uh, the kids have been building a, a robot that they can control with a computer, so they've really enjoyed doing that, sort of the, exploring the technical side of things. Um, they've also enjoyed taking the um, mouth swabs so they can grow bacteria in their mouth. The forest isn't the only thing that's captured the hearts of those here in Salford, and the Science Jam that's hosted every year is a constant success. 
Um, so my name is Hannah and I'm a PhD researcher at um, the University of Salford and I'm in the School of Environment and Life Sciences um, and I'm taking part in the science gem um, this year showing um, some of my research and what I've, I've gathered. Um, so the Science Jam has been going on for the past couple of years and we do attract a lot of people to it. Though the forest is by far one of the most interesting and thought-provoking exhibits here in Salford, there are three whole floors of fun that can be explored from root to branch. Matthew Wood, Keys News. Imagine a world where you can touch sounds or even taste them. Well, in the sensory sound pit, it has been made our reality. Our reporter, Neve Hunter, went to find out more. For the majority of us, our senses aren't something we usually think about every single day. We usually tune out the hustle and bustle of the city, but today, in Media City, Sensory Sound Pit is going to change all of that. Manchester's known for its science festival and the variety of events it has to offer, but today we're taking a closer look at the Salford Science Jam and an even closer look at the Sensory Sound Pit. The Sensory Sound Pit combines sight and sound to create an immersive tactile experience which everyone can get involved with. But where did it all come from? So my name is Di Mainstone, I'm artist in residence for the European City of Science and I am an artist from London and I create new musical instruments. I liked the idea of working with neuroscientists to develop an installation that would allow us to experience what it is to have synesthesia. Um, the idea that you might be able to hear a sound and see it as a colour or a shape simultaneously. So the sensory sound pit opens up our minds to help us experience things in lots of different ways whilst being creative. But how are people finding it? Great, it's been re really wonderful hasn't it? We've been like uh, able to go and mess with stuff and touch stuff and get involved and I thought that's been the bit I've most enjoyed. The thing where you just put your hands forward and all these weird things appear, it's really cool. But how will the Sensory Sound Pit progress in the future? I really hope that this project could continue to tour and be seen um, because so many people who come in here and see it suggest that it could be useful for different scenarios, like as a kind of therapeutic tool, as a new musical instrument for the 21st century. Um, so who knows, watch this space. So despite the Sensory Sound Pit being an almost pitch black art installation, it's been very enlightening. Now I'm going to go and explore the rest of what Salford Science Jam has to offer. Neve Hunter, Keys News. Now virtual reality used to be something from the world of science fiction, but in 2016 it's a technology that's here to stay and one that you can jump into for as cheap as £5. Our reporter Jamie Gibson entered the virtual world to find out more. One of the biggest developments of the past decade has been virtual reality, headsets that can immerse you in completely different worlds. VR has existed since the 1990s, but it's the latest wave of headsets such as HTC Vive, Oculus Rift, PlayStation VR and more that are really pushing the technology inside the headsets forward. To find out more about VR, I spoke to Simon Lunn, who helps run a meetup group in Manchester dedicated to VR development. You're completely occupying someone's, someone's vision, and with headphones their auditory system. So as far as your visual perceptive system and your auditory uh, perceptive system is concerned, as far as your brain is concerned, if we get it right, it feels real. That it's not just strap a game to your face, but it's visit a new place, visit people where they are. Um, it's about you know, solving problems of, of, of distance and um, extreme and dangerous activities and bringing them all to people in, in, kind of in a safe and exciting and interesting way. And you know, it's getting to the point where it's as simple as taking the computer out of your pocket and strapping it to your face and you can be anywhere and perhaps you can do anything. As I tried out the headset, everything Simon had spoken about started to make sense. I wondered how Greater Manchester's development community was taking advantage <laughs> of VR and all of the different experiences that it has to offer. You know, what we've seen in Manchester with um, places like The Landing getting ready to um, you know, launch an incubator for VR businesses, places like Rise in, uh, in Deansgate looking at hosting VR, like future artists and they're kind of, they're getting ready to kickstart a VR arts thing, as well as, you know, groups like VR Manchester, a meetup where, you know, over 400 people from the local community have joined and are coming regularly to meetups. The community here feels um, really, really vibrant, it feels exciting and, you know, news that IMAX are bringing their VR experience to, to Manchester first kind of puts a stamp on to say, you know, this is a region that has an opportunity to build on its incredible games history, uh, its incredible development talent and the community spirit that we have here and make a real difference in what is a very exciting emerging market. Well, I haven't tried VR until today, but now that I've finally tried it, it's quite frankly, it's blown my mind. 
It's gaming applications may be widespread at the moment, but I think it's the wider uses of VR that are going to change our lives in the future. Jamie Gibson, Keys News. Joining us now from Salford University is Professor Stefano Marini, who is the Associate Dean for Research from the School of Environment and Life Sciences. And Diana Stan, PhD student in Neuroscience. So, well, how good, are afternoon. You? Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Uh, maybe could you tell us a bit more about what you do? Are you a PhD student? Are you so I'm a PhD student in my final year at mm -hmm. Salford University. I research neuroscience, in particular Alzheimer's disease, so I look what goes wrong in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do? I've been a marine biologist for the best part of the last 20 years, and I mostly study ocean biodiversity using DNA technology. All right. So um, how would you invite young people to get involved into science? What advice would you give them? So it's very challenging because daily we just do research, like scientific research, so we use very scientific terms and we do lab experience. So we're try just trying to engage with science communication, so as in festivals, like the one that just happened last weekend, over the weekend, I was just volunteering, so we were doing brain games, engaging uh, families mm -hmm. from children to adults. So we were, for example, having a piece of equipment, a virtual reality equipment, where people had to look through the eyes of an old lady just walking down the street, and she was experiencing symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So people were very shocked, including kids. They were really enthusiastic to see what's going on. And yeah, we even just if, saw that. That was great. That was yeah, really interesting. Yeah, even if they didn't really understand what was happening, we were trying to explain them what goes wrong with the brain in people with like Alzheimer's disease. And they were pretty interested. They were like really moved on by what they were seeing. Can I ask, I mean, but, uh, this is a question for both of you. Do you think uh, there's been a bit of a change in the science industry since Brexit? Well, I mean, think about the big, biggest challenges that we face. Like, think about the climate changes, the, the um, uh, pollution, mm -hmm. uh, food security. They're all global challenges. So if you, if you start uh, cutting the wings to science and you start mm -hmm. saying, well, actually, the borders are this, then you prevent students from crossing countries and boundaries. You prevent uh, top scientists to, to be establishing networks and access different types of funding. You reduce the flexibility, and science has to be flexible because it has to have um, uh, open boundaries. So, All right. So uh, what about for the future? Where are we going next? Well, I think that uh, it's obvious that communication is important, but communication works everywhere. It has to be uh, from the youngest generation. It has to be also between scientists and policymakers to make sure that what is important to underpin the future of science. Do you agree with that? What do you think? Yes, I think so. Me as a researcher, I mean, it's very uh, difficult. I mean, the news about the Brexit came really as a very difficult. And I think it's very important because we are, we are very optimistic as young researchers and we have hope. Thank you. And I think that's all we've got time for, but thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very us. much. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> Paris-based artists Hee Hee display their latest art exhibition, Cloud Crash, at the Museum of Science and Industry. It features art pieces and raises awareness about pollution in Manchester. Priya Matharu went to the museum to see the science shown through art. Manchester was on cloud nine at the weekend as artists Helen Evans and Heiko Hansen, together known as Hee Hee, presented Cloud Crash. Mm. Their art demonstrates the pollution taking place in the atmosphere. The Cloud Crash exhibition um, consists of three works um, which are all designed for the site of the Mosey, which is an industrial heritage site. Um, and in this site, of course, the Industrial Rev Revolution produced a lot of emissions over the course of the last 150 years. Um, and these emissions are, are quite absent in our landscape today. So each project is about putting these clouds, these emissions, back into the context of the Mosey. So the first project here is, a, is the greenhouse project, which is called Burnout, which is a, a greenhouse which has its own atmosphere, which is generated by the Tate Modern, which was a former um, power plant. And then there's Airbag, which is a, an abandoned car and Diamonds in the Sky, which is a video piece that features Beetham Tower here in Manchester. There was a Q&A discussion with Hee Hee and some scientists. A tour of the art pieces also took place, where people seemed to be impressed by what they saw. It's been really interesting to see all the artwork. And when it's dark and you can see all the light and glowing, it's been really lovely to see it in a different daytime. This makes you think we've got to do a lot more quicker 
you know, you really do, because, I mean, look at that. It's, if that's happening now as we're speaking out there, but you can't see it, and through science and art we're allowed to see it, it, it just makes you take a step back and think, well, maybe we need to do more quicker. Government should look at it, you know. <laughs> It's safe to say that people have enjoyed learning about science through art and it's made us think about ways to ensure a cleaner and better future. Priya Matharu, Keys News. Joining us now is Dr. Arimma Oshu, a lecturer in digital science communication, who's going to be telling us about her amaranth and mushroom hack. So I've got to ask first, what have you brought with you? Yeah, I think we both want to know, what are they? These look like, these look like mushrooms, as far as I can see. Yeah, um, so um, we've been growing mushrooms on coffee. Can I pick this up? Is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and if you turn it round, okay. you can see on this one... Um, this, looks like, this looks like a very, very old rotten meal, I have to say. If I, I, wouldn't <laughs> this, this would be, I wouldn't want this in my kitchen, I have to say that. You know? well, well, they, these have been in my living room. They have. Uh, yeah, so, so you're, we've got coffee grounds here. You can't see them because they're covered in a white substance, and that's the mycelium okay. or the mushrooms. Yeah. And you can see that the mushroom is just starting to pin or fruit there. And okay, so, yeah. so, so, that's, wow. so the idea is we're trying to show people how you can use waste on which to grow food. I see. So, do, uh, these, so these, these are, are oyster, then. These Yeah, are you can eat them. So these, these are oyster mushrooms. Yeah. And people have you, have you have tried one? I have, yeah. I've had can some for breakfast. Are they actually. edible now? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I wouldn't eat these right now. I'd cook <laughs> them first. Oh, OK. <laughs> so uh, what's the what, what's the, the long term aim then with, with this? Is this something uh, that uh, I, I mean, is, is there a way are you going to sort of teach kids how to sort of uh, grow their own food and that kind of thing? Yeah. So we, we talked earlier about global challenges and some of those challenges. How could we work on them together locally? So the idea is that we bring science into this process, get people thinking about those global challenges. But part of that is how do we grow our own food? How do we become more sustainable in the food growing process? If we can teach young people to, to grow on coffee grains their own mushrooms, <laughs> then you can eat those at home and those, that food is not travelling all the way around the world. So, I mean, we're not going to grow enough food to feed everyone in Manchester or Salford. Well, you're certainly making we're making a start. Fun. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And you've also, you've also deal with about the science of love. Can oh, yes, that's more right. I don't know how mushrooms and love sort of come together. They're very, you know. Um, yeah, maybe they don't quite. We've got a very different menu for, for mm. amaranths, which is all about the science of falling in love. Can, can you get me a girlfriend from this? Um, maybe if you had a date already and you wanted to get ah. a bit closer, that could... That I wouldn't could bring work. the mushrooms, I'd have to admit no, that. Ma maybe, not. maybe not, maybe okay. not. So, so Go we've on. got a three-course meal. Uh, this is for adults, and we're at a fantastic venue called Zifferplatt in the north, northern quarter. And the idea is, there was a study done by Arthur Aaron, and I think it was in 97, and mm. it's looking at um, interpersonal relationships. And apparently, uh, the more you reveal about yourself to your partner, the closer you get. And you have to kind of do that on a continual basis. So he devised a study, 36 questions, three sets of questions, and you ask the question so for example you know who would be if you could choose any dinner guest who might that be that you'd like to have dinner with i'd choose bob dylan who would you choose um, so it's so, like so, well, an interview then a date <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, no, I, I, oh that's not a date is it well you know <laughs> if you're that way inclined i suppose i'm not sure bob dylan is though anyway uh who would I, so a dinner date anyone go on, who would you choose and and has this worked so far and so part of it is the more of these questions that you ask, each one kind of opens you up a bit more. So another one is um, around um, if have you got something that you've never done and you've been dreaming to do it for a long time, and I what might it be? Well, that sounds great. Doctor. Thank I you. Think Very that's interesting. All we've got time for. Thank you. <laughs> Earlier this week, I went along to the Crononium Sleep Lab to find out more about the science of sleep. This year's Manchester Science Festival sees the UK premiere of the Crononium Sleep Lab. Shoppers here at Arndale are invited to recharge their batteries by joining in a 15-minute sleep session. Designed by artists Rachel Wingfield and Mathis Gamackle, the Crononium uses technology to improve one of the most important parts of our daily lives, sleep. So I think the work on the Crononium and sleep probably started about 10 years ago when I was doing research into seasonal affective disorder and developing textiles that illuminated to wake you up. Um, and then more recently I've been invited by Future Everything um, last year to develop an immersive digital experience that looked at well-being uh, that was presented in Singapore. And for me I have a real interest in healthcare 
Um, I would love to see this in, in hospitals. I'm really interested in um, the fact that sleep is um, one of the most important components in, in getting healthy and better, but in our hospitals this is just virtually impossible. We, will, we also, every day that we're here, uh, we have a, a number of homeless people from the streets that are coming in and using it, the space, um, and these people have incredibly troubled sleeps, uh, and I think there should be some kind of crinarium for people who don't have a home. Do you feel more relaxed now you've done it? Yeah, really. It's a, I've, I've had a good night's sleep, but this is just like, it just puts you in a different state of mind, so it's really cool. I definitely felt myself drift off into quite a heavy sleep quite quickly, um, but came back out of it within about two minutes, so that was quite good. Once inside the Cronarian, visitors are asked to relax inside these hammocks. The hammocks, along with the music that's played, create an environmental stimuli that's meant to help us all relax and reset our body clocks. This is Safar Beamish for Key News, signing off to get some sleep. Wake up, Safar. You're not in the sleep lab now. Sorry. In fact, <sighs> would you mind if I tried my own science experiment? All right, go do, ahead. Would you mind? Look, um, this is... I wanted uh, to give this a go. All right, this, this could go either way. Nothing this is fire, a, right? That you've, you've never seen this before. This isn't pre-arranged, you haven't set this... We no, I'm a bit nervous, up. to be honest. You're a bit nervous. Okay, trust me, there's no electroshock therapy involved. Okay, excellent. Unlike Ghostbusters. You see, if you've seen Ghostbusters, you've seen this. It's <laughs> uh, a bit of parapsychology. We've got a circle, a square, a star, a cross, and wavy lines. Now, here's the idea. You've got to think of one of those. Do I have to learn them, or...? You don't have to learn them. Okay. It's okay. Just think of one of those. I've got an identical set, and this is what's going to happen. You're going to okay. think of absolutely any one, and I'm going to try and think, predict what you're thinking. You're going to read my mind? I'm going to read your thoughts. That's something different. And that's worrying. Okay. Okay, how do what I do, do this do? then? So what I want you to do is you can have either set. Have you, have you got what a symbol, a shape in mind? Um, have you got, I, I have to have refresh my memory. And okay. we'll see if this works. All this right. may work, this may not work. Here's the thing, I'm going to predict the one that I think you're thinking of. Okay, don't change your mind, take out the one you're thinking of and put it just face down on the table. Face that's down there. Fantastic. And that really was a free choice. Yep, yep. Have a look again and get another one. Okay, pick another one. Tell, tell me when you've got it. Um, the don't, t don't touch it or take it out. Oh. I'm going to try and guess. I think that's probably the one you're going to go for. So I'm going ahead of you. Okay, so this did is I put one down? this is completely impossible. And you put the one down, the one you're thinking of, but obviously don't change your mind. Because if you change your mind, it doesn't always work. And uh, if this has worked, who knows? You, we might have got the same symbols. Can you see I got uh, a Wavy lines and uh, a square. What do you get? I got a square and wavy, wavy lines. Wavy lines. Do you want to try it one more time? One more time. One more time. That could have I'll been luck. We'll do it again. That could have been a bit of a. That could have been a. <laughs> that might have been. That could have been a fluke. Okay. It? Let's let's try this again. I'm still, all I'm right. Gonna make we're going to we're going to try and do. Why don't we do it with all of them? We've got five. Let's let's see if we can do it in the same order. I'm going to go for the one that I think you're thinking of. Just go round and round in your mind. Okay. Don't pick the circle now. You don't have to. This oh. is a square deal. Honestly, don't go for the square. <laughs> I'm going to try and transmit the thought to you. You can go for any one. I'm not trying to influence you in any way. I'm putting a card down. Don't change your mind. The first one that pops into your head. Done. Okay. What was the? Uh, was that really was your free choice? Look, I got the star. You got the star as well. I don't know why that worked. Try that again. Uh, you, I'll put down. I think. Uh, uh, just, just honestly, purely okay. on impulse, I've put that one down. Don't change your mind. Fantastic. And was that really the one you were thinking of? That was. Would this be scientific? This would be completely impossible. There's no way psychologically that I could have influenced you in any way. Well, unless you're reading my mind somehow. Perhaps. OK, <laughs> well, I got the cross. What did you get? You got the cross as well. Let's so, how? Uh, wait, you've got to explain it to me. What? It's, it's, this is not science. This is magic. <laughs> well, there's got to be some science behind it. The, I'll do one more. Just okay, one this more. one I'll find out. Do you I'll want me to do what, what you... Okay, I'll do it one more time. This time we're going to do it with all the symbols. The okay. final time. I'm going to put down the one that I think you're thinking of. Don't change your mind. Just an impulse. Sure, that's the yep. one you're thinking of. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to put down... Let's have a look. You've got four. I've got four. One, put the next... Just don't purely it. an impulse and don't change your mind. Fantastic. You've got three. I think you might go with... What kind of person are you? I think you'd go with... Uh, I'd say that one. Don't change your mind. Okay. Fantastic. And uh, I think that one, and just go on, one more. Yep. And uh, if this has worked, we should have the same one left. Okay. Do you have the circle? Do you I have, do the have the circle? You do have the circle. We've both got the circle. Isn't that a miracle? Look at that. And yep. from, the, from the top, just obviously deal these out. We've got a square and wavy lines across. And they, that's a miracle. Well, that, that doesn't that make is, any sense at all, does that it? That is there my mind blown. I don't understand. You're going to have to explain to me the science behind that. Well, I, there you go. <laughs> maybe <laughs> next time, maybe next time. Well, that's all we've got time for today. And uh, for more of the latest news, entertainment and sport, join us online at keysnews.net and follow us on Twitter at keysnews. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye.